Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, Casa Cuba at FIU, and all of us at, Book, at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Ruth Behar to discuss her new novel, Letters from Cuba, published by Nancy Paulson Books. Based on Ruth's own family history, Letters from Cuba chronicles a young Jewish girl's escape from Poland to create a new life in Cuba and rescue the rest of her family on the eve of World War II. Strung together by Esther's letters to her sister, the novel documents her observations of life on the island, developments in forming cross-cultural friendships, and deliberations on whether or not she can be both Cuban and Jewish. A testament to human resilience, School Library Journal remarked on Letters from Cuba in a starred review, readers will not want to part with this story of resilience, a must have. In conversation with Ruth tonight is the wonderful Richard Blanco, selected by Barack Obama as the fifth presidential inaugural poet in US history. Richard is the award-winning author of two memoirs and four poetry collections. His body of work and advocacy are characterized by his personal negotiation of cultural identity and universal themes of place and belonging. He currently serves as the first ever education ambassador for the Academy of American Poets and is a member of the Obama Foundation's Advisory Council. He earned his MFA from Florida International University and regularly teaches poetic techniques advanced poetry workshop and special topic literature courses on the poetry of immigrant and brown voices. With Ruth, he is the co-creator of the blog Bridges to From Cuba, Lifting the Emotional Embargo, which provides a cultural and artistic platform for sharing the real lives and complex emotional histories of thousands of Cubans across the globe. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And you can find Letters from Cuba for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep Books and Books running. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the stage. There you are. <laughs> Hello, Ruth. Hello, Hello Richard. <laughs> Hello, <Welcome>. Christina. <laughs> Without an H. <laughs> hi, Ruth. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Buenas noches. Um, uh, it's going to be a wonderful evening, I hope, for, for us. Um, thanks for joining us in celebration of Ruth's wonderful new book, which is just amazing. Amazing as all her work. Uh, I'm going to forego the official kind of bio. We can always find those online and whatnot. Uh, and the list of uh, Ruth's accolades could take up the whole the whole time. So <laughs> enough to say, at the very least, she's got a she's a MacArthur Genius Fellow. Let's just say that, okay? <laughs> um, but um, you know, I'd just like to sort of share some more personal remarks um, and just think about us since, since this is a conversation about how we we go back a long way together and kind of the things we're going to discuss today. We've been discussing for a while, right? So like. Um, uh, Ruth and I, I think we're instant friends since the minute we met, um, and that has grown over time to become literary confidants, and I dare say now we're officially Cuban primos, <laughs> maybe even Cuban siblings, perhaps, <laughs> brother and sister, um, mm -hmm. my little sister, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I've long admired Ruth, of course, from the beginning for incredible, like, the range of her work and what she can do. She's this magical person that can move, move between... Uh, scholarship and anthropology and ethnography to poetry to like uh, non nonfiction works to like a novel to like <laughs> I mean I just I just I often joke with her that you know sometimes I think there's she's cloned herself and there's a little factory on Hialeah that's that has like twelve roots like <laughs> like just typing out books every time we we make a call to catch up it's like oh, Richard. I just finished this book that's coming out. <laughs> and I'm like, when did that happen? I can barely finish one book in like five years. But anyway, I just really admired all that kind of inter interdisciplinary sort of crossing genres. It's part of 
it's part of what we share also, I guess, philosophically and the way we live our lives of always crossing, making bridges and crossing boundaries, right? Now, right and whatnot. So anyway, we're here to uh, celebrate the new book, uh, Letters from Cuba, which continues her journey as already a notable uh, novelist and uh, a young adult author, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but uh, before Ruth is going to read for us for a little while uh, and some excerpts from the book, before we do, we do so, just to get the sort of gears going, uh, starting us off, why don't you just give us like a brief synopsis of the book, Ruth, and like, yeah, what's it about, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Richard. This is so amazing to be with you tonight to launch Letters from Cuba. I'm so thrilled and honored and pleased and happy. So. Thank you, I'm so lucky to have you <laughs> as my friend. <laughs> thank you so much. And of course, thank you to Books and Books and to Cristina Nosti and the whole team at Books and Books is so amazing. And I wanna thank everybody who's with us tonight. I know a lot of my family is there, my mommy, papi, and my son, and, <laughs> and even my husband is watching from another room, I mean, and cousins. So, uh, so thanks to all of you who are tuning in tonight, I'm really, really thrilled. So, okay, so let me try to summarize <laughs> Letters from Cuba. I'll give a very, very brief um, synopsis. So it's a book about a Jewish girl um, from Poland who leaves in early 1938. She leaves behind her mother, her grandmother, her three brothers and her sister, and she goes off on a, on a boat um, to Cuba to meet up with her father, who's been in Cuba for three years. And he's only been able to make enough money to bring one, one of his children um, to Cuba to help him bring everybody else over. Things are getting very difficult um, in Europe. It's the end of the 30s, as we know, growing uh, anti-Semitism, poverty, Nazism, et cetera. And, um, but her father's not a good salesman. He's a very, very religious <laughs> man. He'd rather be praying all the time. He's only made enough money for, you know, for one steamship passage and, um, and Esther, who is the oldest of the children, begs to be the first to go to Cuba. Her father's trying to bring one of the sons um, who is, you know, is like the next oldest, but Esther makes the case that she is the oldest. And even though she's a girl, even though she's female, she's gonna be able to help her father bring everybody over. And she convinces um, her father and off she goes to Cuba and discovers that he's there selling Christian icons. He's peddling <laughs> <laughs> these Christian icons, this very religious Jewish man, and that's what he's doing. And he's not making a lot of money. And she comes to realize that she's gonna, going to have to take a lot of responsibility for this or the family will never <laughs> come um, to Cuba. And the whole book is written as a series of letters that she's writing to her sister, her younger sister, Malka, and you know, telling her about this experience. And, and so Esther is a very curious girl who's discovering this very different place. You know, Cuba cannot be more different from Poland. And so she is discovering this new place as she's also trying to help her father, um, you know, do something very practical of trying to get the family over, um, you know, before things get much, much worse. That's it. And then a lot more happens. I was I was going to say, don't, don't give it all away. But yeah, it's a lot more happens. It's a wonderful yeah. story. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting because um, I've asked this question before and we've talked about it a bit, but like the idea of like, um, what is a young adult novel and what does that mean or a middle grade novel and why the choice to sort of make it that instead of say a, a memoir or a nonfiction book that's geared towards adults. And, and what did you find, you know, what have you found that um, sort of, what are the pluses of that? And like, why this choice? And like, because I, I again, I found it as engaging as reading another kind of novel, right? That's geared to adults. And it's this, this weird wor world that we're in right now with publishing um, that, you know, it's the, the what is for whom and whom is for what, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. Well, you know, um, the first book, Lucky Broken Girl, kind of launched me into this path of writing for kids. You know, I wrote that book. It was based on my life. Um, the character is Ruthie. And I was writing it in the voice of a 10-year-old girl. 
And I wasn't even sure what I was doing, but by the time I finished the first draft of that manuscript, I said, I think this is a book for kids. And so, um, so I kind of jumped into this field of children's literature and, and I've loved it. And, and Letters from Cuba, it just felt right to me for it to be, for anybody age 10 and up. I love the idea of writing a book that a young person can read, a 10 year old, an 11 year old can sit there and read this book and understand it perfectly. But also, you know, my mother can read the book, you know, that, that everybody can read the book. And so I love that idea of writing for kids. It just feels like it opens up a space for many more readers. It can be a family read. You could have a mother and daughter read it together, you know, or a mother and son read it together. So I thought that was just a, a lovely idea and practice. And, you know, I've been an educator for so many years of my life, and I've mainly been teaching college students. But I've often thought that really a lot of the things I teach, I should be teaching them to younger people that maybe we've got to start you know, when we're kids, not wait till people are 18 or 19 or 20, but why don't we start when they're 10? And then there's this movement and organization that I think is so amazing called We Need Diverse Books. And I just, you know, urge everybody to look them up. We Need Diverse Books. And they have this philosophy that there should be a book for every child, a book that, that any child can find a book that they can identify with. And so I thought about that and how, you know, it would have been great when I was a kid if there had been a book about a Jewish girl immigrating from Poland to Cuba. That, that would have been great. I would have seen myself in that book. That book didn't exist when I was a child and it didn't really exist now. And I felt, okay, I've got to bring Esther, you know, into the world of children's literature. There's got to be a young person like Esther, you know, a young Jewish immigrant from Poland landing in Cuba and you know bringing all these different identities together wouldn't it be great to introduce children to that world and so i think that was what kind of gave me the push you know to to make it a book that you know that is technically called middle grade um, so it's 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 this <laughs> it's this area between picture books that are you know for kids that are much younger and then of course YA young adult books for teenage kids so this is that time between ages like 9 and 12 um, and I think it's a very special time in the lives of kids I think it's a it's a time when kids read a lot kids in that age group read a lot and they're very open to different kinds of books you know like for example when I published Lucky Broken Girl, I was afraid that the boys wouldn't be interested in that book because it's about a girl. And I was surprised, like 10 year old boys were like perfectly okay with it. Yeah, why not? And they identified perfectly. They didn't have all of these like gender binary type issues. So there's something about that age group that is also just very appealing to me. I feel like kids at, in that age group are very open and I've, I've enjoyed, you know, conversing with them about the, the earlier book. And I hope I'll have that experience with uh, letters from Cuba too. That's awesome. Like, yeah, you're of course still making me think. Like, well, of course. Like, why do we, I didn't read? I didn't read someone like me till I was like in my MFA in in college and yeah. in, in, in my master's program. And then like, and it took that long. And the first time was our mutual friend Sandra Cisneros. I was like, oh, I get to tell my story. Like, I don't have to write about daffodils. <laughs> so that is, that, I can see, I, I'm literally like, I can see such inspiration in that because let's get them while they're young, so to speak. And just yeah. so, that we, so they can have confidence and move forward in the world in, in that great way. Like, that, that's, that's awesome. I can. And learning something new for even even to this day after 30 years i'm still learning something new from ruth <laughs> um so speaking of like a broken girl you know that that was a little more auto i think we've had this conversation about being an auto novel i mean clearly you're a character in there and whatnot and yeah. here you're not so much a character at least not at least not seemingly you're not a character in this um it's at a different time um but i wonder how you are sort of figuratively present in this because it's still autobiographical it just has to do more with a historical autobiography than your your experience uh growing up in queens so how did how did that happen and like or how are you in the book in some ways <laughs> Well, I think I'm very present in the book in, in various ways. I think the kinds of things that Esther, my main character, is interested in, you know, cultural diversity, Afro-Cuban religion, those, those are things that I'm very interested in. So, um, so Esther's interested in them. But I think also, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this too, that um, 
you know, that we're both very curious about the people who made us, you know, the people who came before us. I'm really curious about that time before I came into the world, you know, like what was going on and who were the people that were creating, you know, the journey, the trajectory that would then influence my own life, you know? So I wasn't born yet when, you know, my grandmother got to Cuba and she was experiencing all these things, but the decisions that she made in many ways to help to create the path that I eventually took, right? And so, so I think it's this curiosity about that, even though it takes place in an earlier time, it's this effort to imagine what it would have been like to have been alive then. And so I think that's where I'm kind of present. I'm trying to sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like a spirit inside my grandmother's, you know, body or something. And I haven't been born yet, but I'm kind of watching her to see who I'm going to be because of the decisions that she's made, if that makes any sense. Um, so, oh. um, in fact, I have, I have an altar here next to my desk with you know pictures of my ancestors and I have a candle lit for my grandmother. So I wanna be sure that you know, her spirit is with me you know, today when I'm giving this, this launch presentation. And yeah, so I think that's, that's where I'm very present. I'm kind of like wondering, you know, like you know, what are the decisions that Esther, even though she's totally fictional, not exactly my grandmother at all, but what are the decisions that she's making? How open is she to this new world in Cuba? And how is that going to, in some way, then become something that gets transmitted to me, you know, that get that I inherit afterwards? I think that's that's where I feel very, you know, very present in the story. <laughs> right. So you're like kind of like this this sort of ghost that's sort of informing yeah. everything. No, I totally yeah. get that because like yeah. um I, I I always have the same in my head. I've always wondered that same question. Like what does so many decisions are made before you become who you are? Like you think you're born and you're like, like you, you create your own destiny. It's like, there's so many decisions that are made and so many people have to move through life before you are. And so by the time you're born, like I always say, you're born in the fifth act. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's I would say you're born inside a story that's already begun by others, and so, but that's my, that might be your influence as anthropologist and, and ethnographer on me. But like, yeah, it's like we think we're we just come from this this one place, and we don't realize that it takes generations and generations. That really, that's the, our lineage is all these people sort of um, making decisions, and and so we go back in time, right? Like that's. The, just made me realize that it's a beautiful part of the book and I can see how, yeah, and I also see how Esther, like Esther is like, there's little things about Esther, I'm like, uh, that's Ruthie. <laughs> but I know, I know you better than most readers, but yeah. Um, so one last question before you read for us. Um, um, you use uh, letters, the, the epistle as a sort of a framing device, and I wonder how that choice came about? Was it challenging? I also wonder, I mean, there's a little moment where where uh, Malika writes back, like a little note, but I wonder, I just, I, I, I don't know, as a reader, I, I was assuming all the letters were sent, but then the, and the only letters that come are from the mother, and then the mother also sort of, there's a little bit of tension somehow between mm -hmm. Esther and the mother. So how did all that sort of <laughs> yeah. manifest and what is like, again like how how did that how did that framing device sort of work for you or not work for you? what were the challenges of that yeah well i'll tell you i mean i love letters i just love letters as a form as a genre and i read i, ha I mean i have one right next to me here i have a book that's like just like this huge book over here called writing home this is a <laughs> that collects letters, you know? So it, to these collections of letters, I'm really fascinated by the letter form because everybody writes a letter at some point. And certainly in the past, immigrants totally depended on letters. And now maybe we use text messages, but it's still the same concept. You're writing a letter, you're directing it to a particular person. And I love that idea because I find that with a lot of stories, I wanna know who is telling the story to who. I feel like that is important. Who is the listener? For who is the story being told? So I've always been interested 
both in my anthropology work and the fiction work, like the relationship between the storyteller and the story listener. And I think they're both important. Who's listening is as important as who's telling. So I had all of that in my mind. And then, then I had the idea that letters are so important to immigrants. I remember both of my grandmothers, my you know grandmother Esther, and then my other grandmother, my Sephardic grandmother, both of them really you know treasured letters that they would get from relatives who lived you know elsewhere in the world. And these letters were so precious. So I thought of the letter as just such an important thing. And it's, it's a form of writing that everybody does. You don't have to be a credentialed writer to write a letter. People write letters. So I like that idea of the letter. And, um, and then I had read a book called Letters from Rivka by a writer named Karen Hesse, a beautiful book, also an immigrant story about a Russian Jewish girl immigrating to the United States via Ellis Island. And I thought, wow, that's such a beautiful book. It was all written in letters. And it was also all letters that Rivka was writing to her cousin back in Russia. And it was just Rivka's letters all being collected in, in a book, actually, inside a, a book of Pushkin's poetry. So her letters were just just hers. You know, There wasn't a response to the letters. And so I thought mm -hmm. about that. And I thought, well, the letters really don't need a response. You know, it's Esther writing them to Malka and the letters become magical to Esther, to both sisters really, because Esther keeps writing them and she thinks that if she keeps writing them, Malka at some point is gonna make it to right. keep, have to read them, right? And so there's kind of like this magical thing that if she keeps writing the letters to Malka, the letters, the words themselves will bring Malka across the ocean to her. So it's kind of like an act of faith writing the letters to Malka that Malka will one day be in Cuba and read them. So there was that. So I thought that was, that made sense to me. But also it was the idea that, you know, I thought if I was going to have letters coming back and forth, that was going to take a long time. Letters took a long time to go back and forth, you know, several weeks. And then I thought, well, it's going to take a long time to get the story to progress if I'm going to have, if I'm going to be waiting for letters to go back and forth. So I also thought just because I wanted the story to take place over the course of one year, you know, right before the war, right before 1939, I had to find a different device. And so that was why the idea of Esther just writing the letters to Malka, holding on to them, you know, holding on that it's going to be her gift to Malka and to say, look, you know, this is what happened to me the year I was away from you here, you know, here's here, this is for you. And writing them just for Malka because her father doesn't know she's writing the letters, her mother doesn't know, so they're just for Malka. So it's like a very special gift. And in terms of writing the book, I have to say that I usually need to be tricked into writing and knowing that I was writing letters <laughs> just made it much more doable to me because I would sit down and go, oh my God, now what am I going to write? And then I would say, well, just write a letter to myself. I was like, <laughs> right. a letter. You, you don't have to write a chapter. <laughs> You're just writing a letter. What's going to happen in the next letter? And somehow that tricked me into writing the book because I mean I was busy teaching and you know traveling back at that time and you know I was very busy and trying to find time to write this novel but since it was letters it kind of seemed doable to me it's like okay I'm just going to sit and write a letter you know it doesn't have to be perfect it's a letter it's a letter that she's writing to her sister and so that was enough to of course you know I did a lot of revising later but like the first draft it was just like raw it was just like a letter that one girl would write to her sister, and and that made it made it something I I felt I could manage. <laughs> right. So uh, it reminds me, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, I think. Um, but also, that's a poetic device too, like the letter poem. So it's like yeah. you write a letter that's never really sent, but it's just kind of like that one way communication. That in the end, it's it's as much about just a communication to the self as it is to the beloved or, or whatnot. So um, time for a little excerpt maybe um, uh, from sure. the book. Yeah, let's see. Do you have any preferences or should I choose? No, you ch you can choose. I mean, they're also wonderful and also and also like, so sort of can like live on their own. So like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll read something. I want to read something brief um, so we can keep talking. Um, yeah, I'm torn between re reading all of you, reading the first or the second letter. Um, I'll, I'll read the first, the very first, the one to Papa, because that kind of sets the stage. So this is the very, very first letter um, in the book. Govorovo, 
So she's from Govorovo. This is a town in, in Poland, Govorovo, December 2nd, 1937. Okay. Dearest Papa, I am writing to you out of desperation. I pray that my letter arrives safely in your hands so you will listen to my plea. How is it possible we're still separated from you and that three years have passed since you left for Cuba? Would you recognize us today, your own family? I could fill a river with my tears when I think of you being so far away. Mama worries we will never see you again. Your papa is gone forever, she says. She scares my brothers and sister with those terrible words, but I promise them we'll be reunited. You will be surprised to learn how much I've grown in the last year. I'm taller than mama now, which I know isn't saying much. I try to do everything I can to help here. I go to the woods every day and cut balls of juniper for cooking. After school, I work two afternoons a week for Yolka, the baker, sweeping ashes and crumbs. He pays me with two loaves of rye bread so that for breakfast we have something to dip into, the bit of milk our tired cow, Zisola, still gives us. The other children help as much as they can, especially Malka. She reminds me of you because she's smart and studious and never complains. Every morning she warms the water for Bubba so it won't be too cold when she washes up. Even the twins are old enough to help. You wouldn't recognize Eliezer and Hyam since they were such babies when you left for Cuba. Today they collected three full buckets of berries with Moshe, who they look up to and call Little Papa. This made Mama smile. She is beautiful when she smiles and her blue eyes sparkle. I'm sad to say, not a lot makes Mama smile anymore. It's getting harder and harder for us here in Poland, especially for me and Moshe and the twins, since we all share your dark hair and eyes. There is no chance we can pass for Polish as Mama and Malka often can. The Poles always know we are Jews. Some are kind, but some give us nasty looks and spit on the ground as we walk past. Yet, I've seen them nod hello to Mama and Malka as if they are more worthy just because of how they look. Mama is still angry about the loss of our store in Govorovo and what happened was so unfair. Now that I'm older, I understand that the government overtaxed you and put you out of business just because we are Jewish. You had no choice but to leave Poland to find work and take care of all of us. I don't know what we do without the money you send us from Cuba. I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about all of this. According to Jewish tradition, I will be an adult when I turn 12 in a few months. The truth shouldn't be kept from me, which is why I'm upset that Mama tried to hide your letter. She knows how much I miss you, and I'm always asking if you've written. I thought we hadn't heard from you in so long because the mail's unreliable these days. But then I found your letter squirreled away inside her shoe. I had gotten suspicious because suddenly we had a little bit of meat to eat with our potatoes and the money had to come from somewhere. When I read your letter, I understood why Mama hid it. She didn't want me to know that you now have enough savings to bring only one of us to Cuba. Papa, you write that the child who should travel first is Moshe because he's the oldest of the boys and you think he'll be the most capable of helping you work. But I'm the eldest and stronger than you think. By birthright, it is I who should come. Please, Papa, <clears throat> choose me. Don't think less of me because I am a girl. I will help you show Mama that it wasn't a mistake for you to go to Cuba. I promise if you let me be the one to come first, I will work hard and make you proud. I'm eager to see you, dear Papa, and hear your voice. Put your trust in me. I will not disappoint you. Your loving daughter, Esther. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the very first letter, right? Like, that's I'm, the very I, first letter. I was letter. just like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm I'm doing this, <laughs> right? So you made me, you're making me think about like, uh, sort of how beautiful overall the whole the whole book. Like, you know, we've talked about the many different Cubas that there are, and how through Esther's eyes, which is obviously also through your eyes, as you were saying, how we get to see this other dimension of Cuba that to me is always like when we have conversations, it's always like, wow, that's another part of Cuba that I didn't realize. And um, I'm thinking back to um, our trips <laughs> to Cuba <laughs> and like when we show each other, like I'll show you my Cuba, you show me your Cuba <laughs> kind, of, <laughs> kind of thing. And then one of those trips, um, cause I've always gone to Cuba mostly to see just family and campo, you know, like we kill pigs. We like, <laughs> we're in the sugar mill towns and, so, and I've taken Ruth there. But in one of those trips, Ruth showed me her Cuba, which was like this more, the Havana and the synagogues, we've been to the synagogues together. I mean, and just the art world of Cuba that I never really knew. And in one of those instances, right? Remember Ruth, we're sitting at this, I forget what restaurant. Do you remember what restaurant it was? <laughs> it was I we were yeah, yeah, I I can't remember the name, but we were up. It was up up the stairs. Yeah, yeah, the terrace. <laughs> like oh, we're sitting with Ro back. with Rocio, who studied painting in Leningrad, right? Yes. <laughs> with her uh, ex girlfriend, who doesn't speak a word of Spanish. She's like her and I are slinging vodka shots. <laughs> Ruski, you know. <laughs> I'm a Cuban gay man from Miami. Ruth is like this. Jubin from Queens, New York. We're all like just having fun. And I get back that night and I tell Ruth, why were we, why did we not feel any different from each other? Like it was just like the conversation of identity or like where we're from or like whatever, that sort of conversation that we're, we are always engaged in, in the United States, right? Just didn't seem to appear. We were just accepting of each other. And Ruth said something to me that said something to the effect of like, you know, that like Cuba has always been a cultural crossroads. And so in a, in a place where everybody's different, nobody's different. And this became the inspiration, uh, the thematic inspiration for the poem that I wrote for the uh, U.S. Embassy, uh, for the reopening of the U.S. Embassy, which the line goes like, no one is the other to the other to the sea. And I think she knows that. If not, she knows it now. <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. oh, no. but definitely that is such a big part of this book that I just love so much. This idea of like, at the same time, cultural diversity with a sort of syncretism, which is rare to find in a place because when we claim diversity, sometimes it's at the expense of like understanding that cultures merge. And that's such a big part of the book. So let us know, like, you know, for, this obviously involves anthropology, it involves ethnography, <laughs> it involves poetry, it involves how does that, that seems to be a very big part of the book. Yeah, no, it is. And it's so interesting that you mentioned yeah. Rocio. I don't know if people can see, but I actually have two pieces there. <laughs> that's one and the other one, there's a bit of glare. But anyway, but I, I'm sitting in, in the room where I write and I have these, these uh, pieces by her that, they're always accompanying me, and one actually right in front here that I that I can't show because I can't turn my computer around. But anyway, I have another piece by her. So I'm, I'm always surrounded by Rocio's work. I've always loved her art, and it's it's very woman centric. And I, you know, I've always been like so amazed from the time I met her back back in the '90s. So we're very old friends, and and I remember vividly that time that the four of us went out. It was like, such an amazing, <laughs> such an amazing group. <laughs> group of people and we were just all so comfortable um, with each other. I think I even drank some vodka that night. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was pretty amazing. And, and yeah, I mean, I think this idea of diversity and difference and that nobody's the other to the other, you know, well, the whole concept of the other, of course, comes from anthropology, right? So, you know, so anthropology begins as this profession that is in search of the other, right? Like you're not studying yourself, you're trying to understand the other, like another culture, another religion. You know, you already supposedly know yourself. So you're gonna, you know, you're gonna learn about yourself through the other and there's gonna be like some mirroring through that process. So so I bring that anthropological idea to to my thinking, you know, all the time, you know, because I got brainwashed by anthropology very early in my 20s. So so I, you know, I think in term in those terms, but but Cuba is so unique in terms of these, you know, issues of culture and religion and the convergence of people from so many different 
places it's been described as, you know, as a culture that's made up of translation. And you have people converging, you know, from just so many different places from the very beginning. Because if you go back to 1492, you know, when Columbus lands in Cuba, you know, up on the, the eastern end of Cuba in Baracoa, he brings with him, you know, a converso Jew. <laughs> he brings, you know, one, one of these people that's converted from Judaism to Catholicism under pressure from the Inquisition and, you know, and the Edict of Expulsion and so on. He brings this guy, Luis de Torres, who is well known to be a converso. And he brings Luis de Torres in 1492 because Luis de Torres can speak not only Spanish, but he can speak Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic. And he comes along just in case any of the natives happen to speak one of those languages. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from the very beginning, there's this kind of, you know, translation involved in getting to know Cuba. And then as Cuba grows and as Havana becomes such an important port, everybody comes through Havana because all the ships from Spain to mainland Latin America would cross through La Habana on the way in and on the way back, you know, so there were always, you know, people crossing through La Habana was this port where, you know, so many people were crossing back and forth just as they were bringing the gold and silver, you know, would come through Cuba and then go on to Spain, you know, because there was no gold or silver in Cuba. And that had a lot to do with Cuba's destiny as well, kind of for the good in many ways. Um, but anyway, so, you know, so you have all these different people crossing through Cuba already, you know, by the 1700s. And then in the 1800s, Cuba's sugar economy really grows. It, you know, the sugar plantation system becomes really big and they bring a lot of enslaved Africans to Cuba and the African culture and African religions really become important, you know, to, to Cuban culture uh, because so many people come from West Africa in particular and there's this, you know, strong Yoruba culture that gets, you know, implanted in Cuba. And to me, what's so amazing about it is that in order for those religious beliefs to continue uh, being preserved in Cuba, they have to kind of go underground and they have to kind of hide their beliefs under the Catholic deities, you know, so the Virgin of Regla is Yemaya, you know, and, and that's kind of how they manage to hold on to their religious beliefs by kind of merging them or hiding them you know, under, you know, under the Catholic um, deities. And that's so important. And that Cuba is the next to the last country to abolish slavery in 1886. Brazil is last in 1888, which means that a lot of people uh, are coming from West Africa to Cuba, being brought forcibly, you know, to Cuba through slavery. And they're bringing that culture and that religion with them. And then that culture is, you know, is 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 you know being preserved in Cuba in part because the Catholic Church isn't that strong in Cuba the way it is in right. like Mexico or Peru, you know, because there was like not not much to guard. There wasn't a lot of gold or silver, you know, so so they didn't have a lot of you know a lot of people watching over them, and so that left things a little looser in Cuba, and I think that's why all this syncretism developed, and then. By the end of the 19th century, Chinese laborers are coming to Cuba because they need more people to work on the sugar sugarcane plantation. So then you have that huge Chinese, you know, immigration to Cuba. And then the Jews come, you know, and become part of this, this mix of people. But also what what I think is so curious is that a lot of Espanoles come to Cuba in the early part of the 20th century after the Spanish-American War, when Spain, the empire of Spain finally, you know, falls apart and Spain is very poor and impoverished because of that. And so you have people from Spain moving to Cuba in the early 20th century, you know, <laughs> right. You have the other thing you have, you know, the Gallegos and Los Asturianos and the Leoneses, Los Andaluces. And then you have a lot of people from the Canary Islands also. So you have all of these different cultures, the Catalanes, you know, and these, all these different cultures from Spain are different from each other as well. So you have all the differences within Spain, all of that, that mix comes to Cuba. And then many other, there are many other immigrants, there are Franceses. I mean, there are many other people of many different backgrounds who find their way to Cuba. Cuba is this very metropolitan place. And, um, and so you have all of that mixing coming together. And I was just fascinated to try to imagine a young Jewish girl from Poland 
ending up in that mix <laughs> of cultures that the anthropologist Fernando Ortiz called an ajiaco. And I love the fact that it's an ajiaco. I mean, it's a melting pot in the US, we call it a melting pot, but I love that in Cuba it's an ajiaco, you know, which is, you know, such a classic, you know, dish that, that we eat in Cuba, but it's made it's made from root root vegetables and it's a very African dish actually, the ajiaco, and that that becomes like the metaphor, you know, for Cuban culture that we have this, this ajiaco, this mix of people where nobody is other to anybody else because there's no other. <laughs> there's, no other. <laughs> there's no other. <laughs> who, who's gonna, who's the other, yeah, who's gonna point yeah. to who, right? Like, yeah. No, and I gotta say that is so brilliantly and beautifully represented, I mean, um, it's almost utopian in a, in a weird way. Like it's so beautifully represented in, I mean, there are of course antagonists also in, in the, in, right. in the novel, but so beautifully represented in the, in the different characters and how, how Ruthie sort of like R Ruthie goes to Mbembe. Right. <laughs> I mean, sorry, Esther, and Ruthie, Esther, Esther goes to Mbembe, right? Like, and like, and like, she said, she didn't know what's going on. She's like, Oh my God, like what's going on here. But they make friend, everybody sort of one for all and all for one uh, with, yeah. with few exceptions, but there are exceptions. And it was just so beautifully handled. Cause it like one of the blurbs, I think to paraphrase, I think I forgot who said that, it makes it gives you some hope in humanity that we can all like actually connect and belong and yet be different and yet all belong together um and you raise the point of the melting pot versus the ajiaco right like so um in some ways um right these are these are where immigrant stories sort of connect cross or diverge because it's also all this is happening in the americas and i think that's part of what you've expressed to me is that, you know, this is also an American story in some ways, right? Like it, it's all connected. Yeah. yeah, let me say something about that because, you know, what to me, what's really important is that my family, my Jewish family, because all four grandparents were Jewish. I'm just focusing on one of them, but all four of them had, you know, really amazing uh, journeys. And, uh, and they went to Cuba because they couldn't come to the United States. And I think that is a very important part of my American story that my family, my gr four grandparents who independently all you know landed in Cuba, they went to Cuba because they couldn't come here, right? There was this immigration act passed in 1924. They had quotas, you know, and they really limited the number of people who could come to the United States from Eastern and Southern Europe. Like the numbers for Poland were like four, four or 5,000 a year. For Turkey, it was like a hundred a year. My, both of my father's parents were Sephardic Jews from Turkey. So, so there were these tremendous limits on, um, on being able to immigrate to the United States. And so I have always felt that my family had to find a different America, you know, that if, if the dream, if the American dream was, you know, the United States, well, this, this America wasn't available to them. And so they went to the other America, this other America in Cuba, partly because, you know, of course, this is pre-internet, you know, nobody had much information on geography and things like that, but but they had a sense, so they knew that Cuba was close. Very right? close. <laughs> Very close. And, you know, and according to the Yiddish press, they would actually tell people, it's so close, you can practically swim over, you know, to the United States, and which some people have done. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so, you know, so they, they went to Cuba with that idea of, well, you know, maybe this will be a temporary place and then we'll go on to the United States. But what I always found so compelling about my four grandparents is they chose to stay in Cuba. You know, there were definitely Jewish immigrants that waited, you know, in in Cuba until, you know, they, they were able to immigrate to, to the U.S., their visas became available and so on. But my family was part of the community that said, no, we want to stay here. You know, this is going to be our America. We don't need that other America. We, this is our America. And I always thought that was so amazing. And, you know, I've written about the Jewish community in Cuba. And one of the things that I think is so poignant is that by the 1950s, this Jewish community of 15,000 people was so sure that they were going to stay in Cuba forever, that they were building these enormous synagogues, among them that the one that we spent some time in, the Patronato, where you know we went in and we met Adela, the president of the Jewish community, and everything. I've got some great pictures of you actually in, in the synagogue, and um, 
and you know, and so they, they were building these, they were building this huge synagogue because they thought they were going to stay in Cuba forever. They, you know, they weren't expecting this revolution was going to come and change their lives. You know, they they thought they were there to stay, and they had even expanded the Jewish cemetery. You know, there's two of them on the outskirts of Havana. They had gotten more land you know, um, from for the cemetery, because they, they thought they were going to be there for more generations. I was supposed to, you know, stay in Cuba. You know, I was, I was supposed to be, you know, um, a second generation Cuban, because my parents are both first, first generation Cubans. And, um, and of course, that didn't happen. And then ironically, while my grandparents, you know, weren't able to come into the United States, then two generations later, after the Cuban Revolution, that's when we finally come right. to the United States, but after being in a different America. So our first America is Cuba, you know? Yeah. And it's really interesting to see that in the novel, because there are people that leave um, um, yeah. and characters that leave for the real America, like they actually say right. the real America, yeah. but it also, it also speaks to this really interesting, like you said, so close, like, you know, as, as, as the slogan was so, so near and yet so foreign, <laughs> it's, it speaks to the U S Cuban relations. That's like this, just the proximity of it has this kind of shared besides history, just a sort of a psyche of like, well, this is as close as we're going to get, but there's also this great history that happens. And then there's the diaspora within the diaspora and all that wonderful. That's just wonderfully rendered in the book. Um, and and like you said, it's also like Lucky Broken Girl uh, is almost like a prequel to yeah. to this book. Like it's really interesting to watch that because reading it, if you read Lucky Broken Girl, you realize, oh, this is what's going to happen, right? <laughs> like it's <laughs> and there is going to be that sense of you never realize how in how that great sense of embracing Cuba and creating a home then gets disrupted again. And so that, that was right. really, so let's close, uh, not close, but, uh, 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 with another expert and then we'll do some question and answer. Um, sure. you'll do the answering. I'll <laughs> do <some> answering too. <laughs> let me, uh, yeah, let me find, um, a brief, a brief passage here. Um, yeah. I've got one. Got one. There's so many that I wanna I wanna read. I um I'll maybe I'll read this one a little further into the book. Um for those of you that haven't read it yet, I don't want to give too much away, but let me read something a little further. I'm torn between the first trip to Havana or a little further in, but I'll read a little further in. I want to tell you about one of um one of the friends that Esther make is makes is a girl named Manuela. Um, who is Afro-Cuban and from an Afro-Cuban family, and um, and she lives in Agramonte. So, um, and they they become very very good friends. So I'll just read these two two very very short pages. Manuela helps her family with their work too. She helps Mario Jose, her father, in the fields, and she helps Ma Felipa, her grandmother, around the house with the cooking and cleaning and feeding the chickens they keep in the yard. She finished elementary school in Agramonte but there is no secondary school in the town. Manuela rubbed the skin on her arm with her finger and used this gesture to show that her skin is a different color from mine. She said, most black people here were not taught how to read and write until recently. Then she pointed to Ma Felipa and said, fue clava, meaning she was enslaved. It was what I had imagined and I felt sad to know it was true. Ma Felipa nodded and placed her wrists against each other and brought both arms up to her heart, showing how she had once been in chains. Manuela said Ma Felipa wasn't allowed to learn to read or write, but she had taught her grandmother to write her name and is slowly teaching her the alphabet. Manuela says she dreams of being a school, te school teacher, una maestra one day, and teaching in their elementary school. She wants to see the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of people who were once enslaved learn how to read and write. I was so impressed hearing her speak, and I hope her dream will come true. Ben conmigo, Manuel, Manuela said, and led me outdoors to the field behind their house while Papa and Ma Felipa remained indoors resting in the rocking chairs. We walked a few feet and stopped before a tree. Seba, she said. It was a tall tree with a few limbs 
and a canopy of rustling leaves. Rather than being underground, the roots bulge from the earth, thick and strong. Manuela showed me a chain wrapped around the trunk of the ceiba. Candles and flowers had been left at the base of the tree as offerings. The chain had belonged to a slave, Manuela said. The tree held the suffering of all the slaves who asked for help. And sometimes at night, when the suffering becomes too much for it, tears drip down the trunk. She pantomimed that she was crying to make sure I understood the meaning of the word lagrimas. I had never heard of a tree that could cry, but so many things are different in Cuba. That's, thank you, Ruth. I, that's just a perfect example of like, I remember reading that and thinking like, and then later when, when the conversation about the Jews being slaves in Egypt and this kind of like just across time and space and like it all happens in Cuba where there's this connection and like, wow, like again, that sort of incredible syncretism and yet this honor and uh, respect to the diversity of the cultures and all through Esther's eyes, which is just such a great emotional uh, anthropological guide for us <laughs> in Cuba. And also like, I just okay. want to include remarks before we go to question and answer, you know, it's just like, I got to say just in a personal, like, again, where we began, there's so many different Cubans, right? And we've shared all those Cubans, yeah. a lot of Cubans between us, but like, um, um, you know, I think there's, we tend to, even as Cubans ourselves, just not open up to thinking about just what an amazing place this is that we come from or or have lived in. And um, and your books do that for us. Um, they, they just give us, they just open doors for us into a, a place that we think we know and, and yet we don't know how, how much more wonderful it is than we even thought. So thank you for that. Thank you, Richard. And I want to say that, you know, I had that amazing opportunity to go to Cienfuegos with you and to see where your parents were from and even to go to the church where your parents married and to be in the countryside where, you know, your parents were from. That was so amazing. And I wanted to honor the countryside in this book because, well, I mean, I love, I love La Habana. I was born in La Habana and I will always love La Habana. But, you know, but my mother's family, my grandmother and her family, they lived in Agramonte. You know, that was where this Jewish Polish family settles in, in Agramonte. They were the only Jewish family in this town. And I always thought that was so amazing and that they were in, in El Campo. You know, that was where they went first. They went to El Campo before going to La Habana. And I thought there was something so amazing about that. And I wanted to honor, you know, those country roots that I know are so strong for you. And that's why it was so amazing to see, you know, your Cuba in Cienfuegos, because I got to see that that countryside, you know, that your family was from. And, and in many ways, my family was from a countryside, too, at least my mother's family. You know, my mother and my aunt Sylvia, they they lived in Agramonte till they were like eight and 10 years old. You know, they, they were little Jewish girls growing up in Agramonte until okay. my, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather won the lottery. He won 5,000 pesos and then they, they moved to La Habana. But until then they had been in Agramonte. And I think that's just something so powerful. It's a part of Cuba that we don't always give attention to, certainly not in literature and you do in your poetry. And I tried to do that in, in this book as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sh the sugar cane in the fields and the, <laughs> no, no, and vice versa. Like you, you gave me a Cuba that I just I never had access to either. Like so, um, but it's yeah, it's that's all in the novel because it's like we need to explore all that together. Um, but yeah, I remember that trip. That was so wonderful. <laughs> we should write a book about that. Why not? <laughs> well, you 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 get one of your clones to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Christina, you want to sort of uh, moderate some questions for Ruth? Um. Sure thing. Okay, let me see. Looks like we have a bunch of them. Okay, here we. Here is Ning. She says, "Congratulations to Professor Behar. In your earlier book, Lucky Broken Girl, you wrote it from your own experiences as an immigrant to the U.S." I wonder how it is different to take the role as your grandmother and claim a Cuban identity to write this new novel, Letters from Cuba. Thank you. I cannot wait to read the book. 
Oh, thank you so much. Well, in this case, you know, Esther, the character in Letters from Cuba, she's actually a Polish Jewish girl who's an immigrant in Cuba. So it is an interesting prequel to Lucky Broken Girl, because in Lucky Broken Girl, Ruthie is a Cuban immigrant girl, right, who's born in Cuba and moving to the US. And here it's Esther who's the Polish Jewish immigrant girl, who's an immigrant in Cuba. So, so I kind of think of these two experiences as, as somewhat parallel to each other. And, you know, and it really was a bit of a challenge to write this story because, you know, I had heard so much about my grandmother's story, but I didn't know what her everyday life was like in Cuba. Like, what, what did she eat? How did she learn Spanish? You know, <laughs> what was it like when she heard the bata drums, you know, you know, in a bembe for the first time? What was all that like? My grandmother hadn't told me all those things. And so that's where the fictional, you know, imagination had to come in. But one of the things I knew, my maternal grandfather, my Zayde, Maximo, had said to me that when he first got to Cuba, all he ate was bread and bananas because he just, you know, he was still trying to keep kosher and, you know, being very careful about what he ate. And so bread was okay. And then banana was this fruit that he'd never had before, but it was very good and very cheap. So he was eating bread and bananas. That was like the first thing, you know, that he ate in Cuba. So I kept that, I brought that into the book because I thought, okay, that's the first thing Esther tries in Cuba. Her father greets her and he's brought challah, which is actually a Jewish bakery in Havana. He's brought challah and a bunch of bananas. And that's like the first thing that he eats. So just, there was so much that I had to imagine because, you know, immigrants don't always tell you what their day-to-day -day life was like, you know? So that's where it's nice to be a fiction writer because what you don't know, you can imagine, you know, from what you know, you imagine it. Um, and so I think that's how I, that's how I crafted the character of Esther, just from what I know and what I don't know, I put that together and came up with her story. And that, so, that, that that banana scene was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, it's like tasting a banana for the first time when Esther's tasting a banana. <laughs> it's like so wonderfully rendered. <laughs> so, this is uh, from Hannah. She says, "Hi Ruth, this is Hannah in Seattle. Thank you for sharing your words this evening. I can't wait to read your new book. Can you speak to how in this book?" you bridge between your Sephardic and Ashkenazi heritages, something we have in common. Is there a tension between wanting to present a peaceful synthesis of these dual heritages versus presenting them as a distinct, to some extent, irreconcilable? Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, Hannah, I don't want to disappoint you, but this book is only Ashkenazi. It's not, about, <laughs> it's not about the Ashkenazi Sephardic conjuncture. That's been something I've written about more in my nonfiction writing and my essays and poetry and things like that. But the next novel, which I've started, which I have a hundred pages. <laughs> you see what I'm book. saying? You see what I'm saying? The next novel is gonna be about a Sephardic boy. That much I know. He's a Sephardic boy in the present, trying to figure out his identity. So the next novel will have a very Sephardic theme to it. This book, you know, I had to just like, just get into my Yiddishness with this book and really thinking about, you know, my mother's side of the family, you know, my grandmother, who the story is about, she spoke Yiddish. She was a Yiddish speaker. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, I didn't, I didn't get to learn Yiddish, but I would hear her and my grandfather speaking Yiddish. And so that's a part of my story. And in this case, I couldn't find a way to merge in the Sephardic. So she is in a very Yiddish Ashkenazi world, and then in a very Cuban world. So I'd, in this particular book, I'd, the Sephardic isn't really there. So all of my Sephardic <laughs> friends and family will have to forgive me, but wait for the next book. Also, oh, Richard, I also have a picture book. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> I have a picture book coming out. It's, it's about Tia Fortuna, and it's about, it's about us. You know this one. It's about Oh, yeah, yeah a Sephardic aunt and her niece. That's going to be a picture book for little kids, for like five-year-old kids. And that's a very Sephardic story. So that that will be coming out. It's it, actually the illustrator is working on the pictures now. So, so Hannah, I have to say that right now, I'm not showing convergence so much as rather separate worlds, but, but I will try to get to convergence eventually. <laughs> so from Michelle, hi. 
As a Ukrainian American Jewish girl, I find it so fascinating how much I relate to both your experiences dis despite not being Cuban and appreciate your generous insights into your culture. What do you think of the universality of the experiences of children of the diaspora? Mm, wow, that's, that's a deep question. Well, I think there is a lot in common um, for all immigrant children or diaspora children. Um, I certainly had that very much in mind. And, and I meant to say earlier when Richard and I were speaking, I'm glad you asked me this question, that, that I had the immigrant crisis very much on my mind when I was writing and I was thinking about immigrant children you know, coming across the US-Mexico border on their own. I was thinking about children separated from their families and being put, you know, in, in cages and so on. So I had all of that in mind and really thinking that, you know, that young immigrants have a lot in common. You know, they're, they're trying to unite their families. They're trying to help their families. They're very brave. They're taking risks. So I think in that sense, I don't know if that's what the question was leading to, but I think that there's a lot of ways in which immigrant children or young people who are immigrants are similar. Um, and then in terms of like remaking a new life, you know, things like learning to translate between cultures and languages, I think is something that we all have in common. And, you know, Richard has this experience as well, where we, you know, we become translators, we're bicultural, uh, bilingual, and, you know, we translate between realities. Um, often, like, we're the ones that kind of, you know, learn how to manage the new place. And we're, you know, we're there kind of as cultural brokers, you know, for, for our families or our parents sometimes. And I think all of those kinds of experiences are very similar for um, immigrant kids of many different backgrounds. And I, I just may add that's certainly present in the, in, in, in the novel with Esther, who like animates the father's spirit, you know, who's like sort of yeah. leads the charge, helps him negotiate because she's seeing the world through, you know, sort of more innocent eyes and more just, yeah, it's perfect. It's wonderfully rendered in the novel too. In that sense, she's the one who becomes a catalyst uh, for for yeah. happy ending, so to speak. So, yeah, yeah. And her openness too. The openness of an immigrant child that's open to right. the new place. Yeah, yeah. From Ada, Ruth, what part of Poland does your family come from? In your search for your roots, have you visited the places of your ancestors? Are you relying on inherited memories? To what degree the voice of this 10 year old is influenced by who you are today? And thanks for sharing. And now I have to absolutely have to buy the book. <laughs> Thank <Good>. you. That's <laughs> great. Well, you know, the, um, the town that the characters from Esther is the same town that my grandmother was from. It's called Govorovo, and it's about two hours from Warsaw. And I amazingly had the opportunity to go to Warsaw, to Krakow, and to um, Govorovo. I was very forced, fortunate to have a graduate student in anthropology many, many years ago, Erica Lair, who's an, an amazing scholar. And she'd written a book uh, about, uh, about Poland and about Jewish memories of, of Poland by the Polish, by the Polish people today. A amazing work. And, um, you know, it was one of these things, I guess these things don't happen to us now during the pandemic, but, but many years ago, I just like at two in the morning, I was just looking for flights. For some reason, I thought I should go to Poland. And, um, and I started looking for <laughs> flights to Warsaw. And I saw that there were some very inexpensive flights. And I immediately contacted Erica and I said, would you be willing to go to Poland with me? And fortunately, she said yes. And so I went to Poland with Erica, my, my former student. And, um, and then we went to Govorovo. Uh, we had um, a driver, uh, a driver and an expert on Polish Jewish history took us there. And it was an amazing experience. Um, but what was more amazing is that after going to Govorovo, while I was still in Poland, thanks to a researcher who was doing oral histories of Jewish people who still lived in Poland, she connected me with a man, Yitzhak Grinberg, who was from Govorovo and now lived in Warsaw. And I got to meet him. And the interesting thing about that, Mr. Greenberg, was that he didn't speak English, you know, he spoke Polish, he spoke Russian, he spoke Hebrew, he spoke Portuguese, he spoke all these languages, he spoke German, but he spoke Spanish. And <laughs> <laughs> so he communicated in Spanish and I learned all these stories about Govorovo 
and it was amazing. Um, so that was an amazing experience, but I only went that one time. Um, and then I've also been only once as well to the town that my father's parents were from, Silivri, which is near Istanbul. And I've been to that town as well. So I saw where they were from. And then I've been to Cuba many times to see the various places where the family lived in Cuba. So I guess you could say I've pretty much gone everywhere except to the town where my maternal grandfather was from in uh, Belarusia. That I have not been there. I guess that's the one place left to visit one day. Okay, here's a question from Nikki. Uh, Ruth, do you ever think of following your young characters into adulthood in future books? Ah, uh, yes, I do, I do. And I wonder if that's a good idea. I mean, this new novel that I'm writing now that I only have 100 pages of it, I'm trying to decide whether the character, who's a boy, whether he is perhaps Ruthie's son from Lucky Broken Girl. <laughs> I'm trying to decide whether that's a good idea or not, or just make it completely independent. Um, so I have thought about that. I've thought of doing a sequel also for Ruthie in her teenage years. I've thought of doing that. Um, I mean, you know, you, you think of some, there's so many stories that you potentially want to write and it's, stories are harder to write than you imagine. So, so you don't get to, you don't get to all of them, but I do think about it. I think in my mind, I try to imagine the futures of these characters and wonder how related they are to my life or maybe make them very different. Um, so I play around with it, but I don't don't necessarily get to do it. Um, I think now I'm maybe moving towards creating more, more fictional characters than the auto novel, as Richard called it, of Lucky Broken Girl. And maybe the first novel is always kind of closer to your own story. And then as you feel a little bit more confident about writing fiction, then you go, oh, well, I, I can just create a character that has nothing to do with anybody I know, um, which I haven't done yet, but uh, but I'm getting closer to that. <laughs> so we'll have um, from Rosa Lowinger, hola, Ruth, congratulations. <laughs> I, know this is not a, I know this is not a question, it's just congratulations. <laughs> She's just saying hi. Oh, um, thank you, Rosa. Uh, Christina, not me, asks, Hola, Ruth, have you read or know Mexican author Sophie Goldberg, who writes about how her family, who are Jewish, they share your last name, arrived to Mexico from Turkey and Bulgaria. They were and are Sephardi. Oh, wow. No, I am going to write that down. Um, thank you. Okay. And then um, from Terry, I understand that Cuba is a real melting pot, but I wasn't aware that it was a melting pot for the black former slaves. Mm -hmm. and I think that we have covered all of them. So, yes. So it feels to me like it was just yesterday that we were together at Books and Books launching Lucky Broken Girl. Yeah. I remember that night so distinctly with both of you there. And we're so grateful that you have tried to recreate it here in our virtual universe and our virtual bookshop. Can't thank you enough, both of you. Congratulations, Ruth. Everyone who's out there watching, please order the, order the book, order a copy. All you have to do is press the green button Bye, at the bye. bottom of the bye, <laughs> bye, bye, bye. <laughs> so we'll ship it off to you right away. And if you don't want to do it that way, you can also come to the store. If you're in Miami, come to any of our stores and you can do curbside pickup or you can just come in with your mask and we will have it right there. A lot of they're on display in a lot of our stores right now. Mm. So, uh, and I think we share, I, I think I speak for Ruth when we share an immense appreciation for books and books always, but now more than ever um, to keep, to let us do this. So thank mm -hmm. you, Christina. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you to the whole staff of Books and Books because you're keeping us, you're keeping us going. So thank you. you're keeping so all wonderful. of us going. <laughs> so wonderful to hear. I mean, I know it's not always perfect. There's always, <laughs> like, I think Ruth has just frozen right there. Okay, see? <laughs> No, I'm getting misty. I'm getting misty. I'm getting misty. Really what is this? I know. I know. That has happened. I want to thank you too. And everything you're doing, Christina. I mean, I I tune in all the time. You know, to these events. They're just so 
meaningful and it is a way to stay connected um, to all of you at Books and Books, to you, to Mitch Kaplan, to the whole team. Really, it's it's amazing the work you do to to keep you know books alive for all of us. And books are so important and more important than ever. Than ever. Uh, right now so really from the bottom of our heart this is so well, you know right back at you <laughs> Lo quiero muchísimo. I, I hope that i can see you in person and give you a hug very very soon so, soon soon enough, soon enough, soon enough. Thank you. we'll say good night to everyone out there Bye, thanks Ruth. for tuning in Bye, Richard. Bye, Christina. Gracias to everybody. 